Hi everybody, welcome to Anatomy with Dr. Rabbitheart. In this video, we'll discuss the gross anatomy of the pharynx and larynx. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe the composition of the pharynx and larynx, including subdivisions, important structures, muscles, and neurovascular patterns. You should further be able to apply knowledge of these structures and patterns to clinical scenarios. In this mid-sagittal section of the head and neck, we can see the oral and nasal cavities, as well as the larynx in yellow and pharynx in blue. The pharynx is a common space in the back of the throat, where the nasal cavity, oral cavity, larynx, and esophagus all meet. This region is shared by both the respiratory and digestive tracts, and thus is a shared passageway for both food and air. The larynx is known as the voice box, but also functions as an airway. It is continuous with the trachea and should only conduct air. We will begin by talking about the pharynx. The pharynx functions to conduct food, liquids, and air from the nasal or oral cavities to the digestive or respiratory tract. It is open anteriorly to the nasal cavity, oral cavity, and larynx, but closed posteriorly by layers of muscle. Therefore, the pharynx is shaped somewhat like a half pipe. The pharynx also contains a ring of tonsillar or lymphatic tissue called Waldeyer's ring around the openings from the nasal and oral cavities as protection from pathogens entering the body through these entryways. The pharynx is also connected to the middle ear via the auditory or pharyngotympanic tube. We will discuss these features more later. The pharynx is divided into three regions named according to the space it's behind. Nasopharynx behind the nasal cavity, oropharynx behind the oral cavity, and laryngopharynx behind the larynx. Each subdivision of the pharynx contains certain features. We'll discuss pharyngeal muscles and Waldeyer's ring first since they span multiple subdivisions, and then we'll talk about each subdivision individually. Let's turn our attention to muscles of the pharynx. Here we are looking at a posterior view of the pharynx as if you were standing in the retropharyngeal space. The posterior boundary of the pharynx is formed by three circular muscles, the superior, middle, and inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Note that the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscle has two parts. This is clinically relevant because a diverticulum can open between the two components leading to dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. The sides of each muscle meet at the midline at the median pharyngeal raphe. The superior constrictor also has superior attachments to the pharyngobasal or fascia and the pharyngeal tubercle. These three muscles are arranged like a stack of cups with one muscle overlapping another. They contract in a sequential order from top to bottom to push food down the throat. All three pharyngeal constrictors are innervated by the vagus nerve. We will now open up the pharynx to look at the small longitudinal muscles, including stylopharyngeus, which we will discuss on the next slide, but is visible on this slide. Stylopharyngeus, which is visible in the previous image, starts at the styloid process and then slips between the superior and middle pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Salpingopharyngeus extends from the torus tubarius to the palate, while palatopharyngeus forms an arch in the back of the oral cavity. Note that sometimes palatopharyngeus is grouped with muscles of the soft palate. Collectively, these muscles function to elevate the larynx and shorten the pharynx during speaking or swallowing. All muscles of the pharynx are innervated by the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, except stylopharyngeus, which is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, or cranial nerve 9. Muscles of the soft palate interact closely with the pharyngeal muscles and include tensor veli palatini, levator veli palatini, muscularis uvulae, and our friend palatopharyngeus, which we discussed on the previous slide. During deglutition, or swallowing, the soft palate raises to block entry to the nasopharynx. Levator veli palatini and the muscularis uvulae elevate the palate, and the tensor veli palatini muscle essentially stretches the sides to keep the palate taut. Muscles of the soft palate are all innervated by the vagus nerve, except tensor veli palatini, which is supplied by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, or V3. Within the pharynx, Waldeyer's ring forms a complete circle of lymphatic tissue behind the oral and nasal cavities. This ring is composed of three collections of lymphatic tissue called tonsils, including pharyngeal, palatine, and lingual tonsils. The pharyngeal tonsil, also known as the nasopharyngeal tonsil or adenoids, is located at the superior most end of the pharynx, behind the nasal cavity. 
The palatine tonsils are in the back of the oral cavity, between the palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal arches. The lingual tonsil is located on the root of the tongue. Note that tonsils can become inflamed, a condition called tonsillitis. In some cases, the tonsils might need to be surgically removed. Note that often when someone says they've had their tonsils out, they're referring to their palatine tonsils. Now that we've covered the general structure of the pharynx, we will talk about which anatomical structures are located in each subdivision, beginning with the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx is posterior to the nasal cavity and superior to the soft palate. It contains the pharyngeal tonsil, or adenoids, which we discussed on the previous slide. It also contains the opening from the auditory tube, also known as the pharyngotympanic, or eustachian tube, and the torus tubarius. The auditory tube connects the middle ear to the pharynx, while the torus tubarius is a raged, raised area of cartilage covered in mucosa and seen above the opening from the auditory tube. Note that the torus tubarius is a good landmark for dissection, as it is relatively easy to find and many muscles of the pharynx are closely associated with this piece of cartilage. The salpingopharyngeal fold can be seen extending down from the torus tubarius and really just represents the covered salpingopharyngeus muscle. The oropharynx is located behind the oral cavity, below the soft palate and above the epiglottis. The posterior boundary is formed by the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle. The oropharynx contains the palatine tonsils and the posterior third of the tongue, including the lingual tonsil. The laryngopharynx is behind the larynx, below the epiglottis, and extending to the inferior border of the cricoid cartilage. The middle and inferior pharyngeal constrictors form the posterior boundary of this area. Contained within the laryngopharynx is the opening into the larynx, referred to as the laryngeal inlet. Lateral to this inlet are depressions called the piriform recess or piriform fossa. The piriform recess is clinically relevant as a common site for foreign bodies to lodge. The pharynx is innervated by several nerves via the pharyngeal plexus, which is composed of fibers from the glossopharyngeal, vagus, and sympathetic nerves. All muscles of the pharynx and soft palate are innervated by the vagus nerve except stylopharyngeus, which is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, and tensor villi palatini, which is innervated by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, or V3. As far as sensory innervation, the maxillary and glossopharyngeal nerves receive sensory information from the upper portion of the pharynx, while sensory information from the lower pharynx is transmitted by the vagus nerve. Blood supply to the head and neck comes from the common carotid arteries, which then branch into internal and external carotid arteries. Blood supply to the pharynx comes from the ascending pharyngeal artery, which is the second branch off the external carotid. Deoxygenated blood is then collected in the pharyngeal venous plexus and drained into the internal jugular vein. Lymph from the pharynx is drained to the jugulodigastric nodes, sometimes called the tonsillar nodes, which are located just inferior to the angle of the mandible, as indicated in this diagram. Before we move on to the larynx, let's pause to check understanding of the pharynx. Feel free to pause the video to think. Which group of muscles form the posterior boundary of the pharynx? The correct answer is the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Pharyngeal constrictor muscles include superior, middle, and inferior pharyngeal constrictors, which form the posterior wall of the pharynx. These muscles contract sequentially to push food into the esophagus. Next question, which structure is indicated by the arrow? Again, feel free to pause to think. This arrow is pointing at the pharyngeal tonsil, or adenoids, which are located in the nasopharynx just above the torus tubarius. This is clinically relevant because excessive swelling of the pharyngeal tonsil can block the opening from the auditory tube. We will now turn our attention to the larynx, which is continuous superiorly with the pharynx and inferiorly with the trachea. The larynx is commonly referred to as the voice box, and although it does produce sounds, it is also clinically relevant as the opening to the airway. The larynx is composed of a cartilaginous skeleton covered in muscles and mucosa, 
The larynx produces sound as air moves out of the lungs and passes between vocal folds. Additionally, the larynx contains a valve called the epiglottis to protect the airway during swallowing. Let's begin our discussion of the larynx. The framework of the larynx is formed and maintained by six named cartilages, three unpaired and three paired, held together by membranes and ligaments. The thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, and epiglottis are all unpaired, while the arytenoid and carniculate cartilages are small paired cartilages. There are also cuneiform cartilages embedded in mucosa and not shown in this diagram. Here we are looking at an anterior view of the laryngeal cartilages. Thyroid cartilage is located inferior to the hyoid bone, suspended from the bone by the thyrohyoid membrane. The thyroid cartilage sits like an open book, where the two sides are like covers of the book and the spine of the book faces anteriorly. The laryngeal prominence, or Adam's apple, is at the superior end of the thyroid cartilage where the two sides meet. Note the angle between the plates is more acute in males, therefore we can usually see the laryngeal prominence as an Adam's apple. Females also have this structure, but the angle is wider, and so it's not as prominent from the outside. Note that the thyroid cartilage has superior and inferior horns, functioning as sites of attachment for ligaments. Infrahyoid muscles like sternothyroid and thyrohyoid attach to the thyroid cartilage at the oblique line. The cricoid cartilage is located inferior to the thyroid cartilage. It's shaped like a signet ring with a thin component facing anteriorly and thick part posteriorly. Importantly, the cricoid cartilage is the only complete ring of cartilage in the airway. The cricoid cartilage attaches to the thyroid cartilage via the cricothyroid membrane and to the trachea inferiorly by the cricotracheal ligament. Now we are looking at the larynx from the back. Here we can appreciate the wider posterior aspect of the cricoid cartilage and see the full epiglottis. The epiglottis is leaf-shaped and composed of elastic cartilage. It functions to protect the airway during swallowing. Finally, we have three sets of tiny paired cartilages. Arytenoid cartilages sit on top of the posterior portion of the cricoid cartilage and have attachment points for vocal cords, called the vocal process, and muscles, called the muscular process. They can rotate, glide, or swivel in several directions depending on which muscles are employed to adjust tension of the vocal cords and size of the airway. Tiny corniculate cartilages sit on top of the arytenoid cartilage. Finally, cuneiform cartilages, which are not visible here, are suspended in mucosa of the larynx called the areopiglottic fold. Vocal ligaments are stretched between cartilages and then covered in mucosa to form vocal folds, also known as true vocal cords. The free edge of the vocal folds vibrate during phonation, or speaking, to make sound. Superior to the vocal folds are vestibular folds, or false vocal cords, which do not participate in sound production. When looking at the vocal cords with a laryngoscope, as in this image, we can see both the vestibular and vocal folds. The opening between the vocal cords is called the glottis. This is the airway. Glottis width changes depending on if the person is speaking, where they are mostly adducted, or breathing, where they're mostly abducted. In a living person or intact body donor, several aspects of the larynx are apparent. The areepiglottic fold extends from the epiglottis to the arytenoid cartilages, essentially forming a ring around the opening to the larynx. The larynx can be divided into spaces by the vestibular and vocal folds. The vestibule of the larynx is superior to the vestibular folds. The ventricle of the larynx is between the vestibular and vocal folds, and the infraglottic cavity is the space inferior to the vocal folds. The larynx is a dynamic structure with muscles acting on laryngeal cartilages to do things like adjust the pitch of the voice or adjust the size of the airway. This is accomplished by intrinsic muscles of the larynx listed here, which will be described over the next couple of slides. The cricothyroid muscle is on the anterior aspect of the larynx. It increases tension on the vocal ligaments, resulting in increased pitch of the voice. Conversely, the thyroarytenoid muscle on the lateral side of the larynx decreases pitch of the voice. The lateral cricoarytenoid muscle is also on the lateral aspect of the larynx and functions to adduct the vocal folds. In other words, it helps close the airway. While cricothyroid is innervated by the external laryngeal nerve, the rest of the intrinsic laryngeal muscles are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve.
The vocalis muscle lies within the vocal folds and functions to make small adjustments to vocal ligament tension. Think about vibrato in a singer. The oblique and transverse arytenoid muscles work with the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle to close the glottis, while the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle functions to abduct the vocal folds, increasing the size of the glottis. All three of these muscles are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Note that the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle is clinically relevant as the only muscle to open the airway. So damage to nerves affecting posterior cricoarytenoid muscles may result in completely adducted vocal folds, which is a medical emergency. The larynx is innervated entirely by the vagus nerve, which splits into the superior and recurrent laryngeal nerves. The superior laryngeal nerve further divides into the internal and external branches. The recurrent laryngeal nerve innervates all muscles of the larynx except the cricothyroid muscle, which is innervated by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Sensory information above the vocal folds is conducted by the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, while sensory signals below the vocal folds are transmitted via the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Lymphatics from the larynx drain two places. Above the vocal folds, lymph drains into superior deep cervical lymph nodes found near the superior aspect of the internal jugular vein. Below the vocal folds, lymph drains into pre or paratracheal nodes, and then into inferior deep cervical lymph nodes. The larynx receives blood from the superior and inferior laryngeal arteries. The superior laryngeal artery is a branch of the superior thyroid artery, which travels through the thyrohyoid membrane with the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, while the inferior laryngeal artery is a branch of the inferior thyroid artery. Blood is then drained from the larynx by companion veins, the superior and inferior laryngeal veins. Earlier, we mentioned foreign objects may become lodged in the piriform fossa in the laryngopharynx. When removing those foreign objects, you must be careful because the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve runs just deep to the mucosa of the piriform recess after popping through the thyrohyoid membrane with the superior laryngeal artery and vein. This nerve then could become damaged during the procedure. So, say you did damage the internal laryngeal nerve, what would happen to your patient? This nerve innervates mucosa above the vocal folds, so damage to the nerve would then result in loss of sensation above the vocal folds. To wrap up, we will discuss the interplay between the pharynx and larynx during deglutition, also known as swallowing. As mentioned previously, the pharynx is a space shared by both the airway and the GI tract. The two processes of breathing and eating need to be separated from one another for proper function. Air through the larynx, into the airway and food to the esophagus. It's not such a big deal if air gets into the digestive tract, but it's very important to avoid aspirating foods or liquids into the airway. So how do we keep things out of the airway during swallowing? We can break swallowing down into three steps. During the voluntary phase or stage one, the tongue pushes a bolus of food into the oropharynx. In stage two, the soft palate lifts, blocking the nasopharynx while the epiglottis closes over the laryngeal inlet, blocking off the larynx. In stage three, sequential contraction of the pharyngeal constrictors pushes the food into the esophagus, and then esophageal peristalsis moves food into the stomach. Last practice question. Feel free to pause the video to think. What is the function of the cartilage indicated here by the arrow? The structure labeled here is the epiglottis, which functions to close over the airway during swallowing. The structure of the larynx is complex, with many small cartilages, membranes, and muscles working together to open and close the vocal cords. Be patient with yourself if these things don't click right away. You may need to review these structures several times. I recommend studying models, images from multiple views, and cadaveric specimens to fully grasp this region of the body. You can also check out the activities linked in the video description. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you like my artwork, subscribe to my channel or follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Dr. Rabbit Heart. Thank you for your attention.
that concludes this video.